This is Tina, and she is just hatching out of her egg as a tick larva. Right now, she looks a bit like demon fingers. Now, ticks are arachnids, and arachnids have eight legs, but as a larva, Tina only has six. And she is very tiny, about the size of the head of a pin. At the time of her birth, Tina is completely free of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. That's because mothers can't pass it down to their babies. So at this point in her life, even if Tina bit you for a bite of blood, you wouldn't get the disease. So how does little Tina acquire the Lyme disease bacteria in the first place? Well, for starters, she will need to eat. Tina will only eat three meals in her whole life, which can be a few years long. So the first one has to be a good breakfast. Now you've probably noticed that she's not much of a sprinter. She also doesn't have any eyes. So she's a bit more of a right place at the right time sort of hunter. Each of her front legs has a special organ called Haller's organ. It can sense moisture, heat, and molecules that help Tina position herself in the likely path of a small animal. If a bird or lizard or rodent passes by, she grabs on. In this case, her first meal is from a mouse. She attaches and starts eating with the crazy mouth parts, we'll get to that in a minute, but what she doesn't realize is that this mouse is what is called a competent host of Borrelia burgdorferi, one of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. A competent host means that the bacteria can live inside the mouse, avoiding its immune system, but without making the mouse sick. Here's what Borrelia burgdorferi looks like. It is a spirochete, a twisty spaghetti noodle sort of bacterium. Now here's the problem. The bacteria live inside the mouse, but the mouse is going to die at some point. So for the bacteria to live on as a species, it needs to have a way to infect other competent hosts. And this is where Tina comes in. This bacteria has evolved to use ticks exclusively to find new hosts. Tina is sort of like a spaceship that helps it colonize new planets. As Tina eats, the bacteria enters her tummy parts and they attach to the lining of her midgut. Look at that, you can see right through her. Once there, they go into a kind of low energy state, sort of like those suspended animation pods that astronauts use in science fiction movies. After three days of feeding, Tina is about the size of a poppy seed. With her little bacteria travelers on board, she drops back to the ground to digest and to get ready for the next phase of her life. As a nymph, when she emerges, she now has her fourth pair of legs. As a nymph, she will have meal number two, and this is where it gets interesting. The bacteria are rooting for Tina to pick another competent host, so they can infect it and keep multiplying. It's like astronauts hoping to land on an Earth-like planet. But Tina can also feed from incompetent hosts. These include some lizards and all ruminants, like deer and cattle. If Tina feeds from one of these incompetent hosts, their blood and immune system will kill off the Lyme bacteria, ridding Tina of the infection. That's right, a deer tick doesn't get Lyme from a deer. This means that depending on her food preference, an infected nymph will either stay infected or be cured. For example, exoded ticks in the southeast of the United States prefer lizards, and therefore Lyme is uncommon. In the northeast, they prefer rodents, and Lyme is everywhere. Now, Tina could also choose a third category of host, which includes people and dogs. In this case, the tick remains infected but gets a good meal. For everyone else, it's a bummer. To the bacteria, we are a dead end. Once inside of us, it has no chance of infecting anything else and our immune system goes completely crazy trying to deal with it. Anyway, Tina the nymph chooses an uninfected mouse. Many other blood feeders, like the Muscoito, are quite precise. They poke their mouth parts directly into a blood vessel. Ticks, on the other hand, do it differently. They are pool feeders or telmophages. It's sort of like when you're on the beach and you dig a hole and then it fills up with water. Imagine that, but with blood <laughs> that you then drink. <laughs> But digging in skin is a little more challenging than digging a hole in the sand. When you're the size of a tick, skin is more like a loose mesh of fibers. Imagine having to tunnel into a giant ball of cotton. To dig, Tina uses these, a pair of chelicerae. Each one can telescopically extend and bend at the tip. By employing a sort of alternate swimming type motion, they pull the matrix of the skin apart. Tina secretes saliva, which contains proteins that numb the area and suppress the immune system, but also cause tissues to start breaking down. When things have been loosened up a bit, both chelicerae extend, bend at the tips, and pull at the same time. This drives that central barbed thing called the hypostome deeper into the skin. 
The hypostone seems to act as an anchor, holding on with all those backward-facing barbs. As fluid from the damaged tissues begin to pool, Tina's mouth sucks it up using a muscular pump. When the first bits of the meal hit the midgut, it seems that the bacteria wake up. Instead of going out through the mouth, which is kind of swimming against the current, the bacteria make their way through the gut wall to the salivary glands, and it's through the saliva that the bacteria enter the host. It can take more than 24 hours of feeding for the bacteria to move to the salivary glands, so if you pull it off early enough, you can avoid the disease. Anyway, after her second meal, Tina is ready for her final molt into her adult form. Males and females look virtually identical in their larval and nymphal stages, but as adults they differ. Females are larger, and males have shorter, stubbier mouth parts. This is because the adult male will not eat again, and instead will use his mouth parts for mating. You'll see. As an adult, Tina will only attach to larger animals, because this meal is a big one. Climbing up tall grasses gives her a better shot at big animals. Well now, it seems that Tina has found herself a mate. Here you can see the smaller male position himself to initiate mating. He aligns his jagged mouth parts with the female's genital pore. After some prodding around, he inserts his mouth parts into the genital pore. Now pay attention. While he's doing that, he exudes a sort of liquidy sac called a spermatophore out of his genital opening. You can see it right there. It looks a bit like a white balloon. The male then deposits sperm into the spermatophore. When the spermatophore is loaded and ready, he pulls his mouth parts out. Then he pulls the spermatophore over to her genital pore and attaches it. Carbon dioxide inside the spermatophore actively pushes the sperm into the female tick. Males can do this two to three times and often meet with females who are in the process of feeding. This last feeding is a doozy. When she detaches after a week or so of feeding, Tina is 200 times her starting weight. This final meal will be used to create her babies, and there's a lot of them. These will be the only eggs that she lays, and they are tiny and vulnerable to dehydration. But she has a special organ called Janae's organ that makes its appearance during the egg-laying process. It looks a bit like a handlebar mustache made out of gummy worms. You can see it right here. As eggs emerge from her ovipositor, Janae's organ catches them between those horns. It then coats the eggs with a waxy secretion, which helps them cluster together and keeps them moist. Tina will lay up to 2,000 eggs, and when she's done, she will die. Jerry, how long is this clip? Does it just, it just keeps going? Well, no, I know she lays a lot of eggs. I just didn't think we'd watch every single one. I mean, it's less dramatic. And then she will die. That's a fade to black. Well, wait, let me say it again. And then she will die. Thank you. That's better. <laughs>